Well, good morning, Meadowbrook Church. How are we doing this morning? It's good to see you. Special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We're so glad that you're with us this morning. So when I was in high school, I played football, and my defensive position was a a cornerback. So for those of you who don't know a whole lot about football, the cornerback on defense is the one who guards receivers as they are going out for a pass. So it was my junior year, uh, one of the first games of the season, and I'm lined up on the line of scrimmage guarding a receiver right in front of him just a couple yards, and the other team snaps the ball, and he goes out for a pass. He goes out to run his route. And he starts by faking that he's going to go inside and go across the field, go across the middle. Um, And I bit on that fake, and then he went around me and smoked me off the line of scrimmage. I mean, just blew right past me, and I knew in that moment that I was in huge trouble. I turn and sprint towards him to try and catch up with him, and I can see because of the distance between he and I, I know for sure the ball is coming his way. I mean, the quarterback would have to be a fool not to throw the ball his way because he was so far beyond me. So I'm running, I'm watching, I'm running, I'm watching, and then I see as he's running, he looks up for the ball, and I can tell by his eyes the ball is coming to him, and he starts to track it in the air. Now, what I should have done in that moment as I should have continued to run, but also look back and try and find the ball and make a play on the ball in hopes that I can get close enough to him to either swat it out or catch it for an interception. Instead, what I did was I was running and I just threw my arms up in the air and I started to wave them around frantically (laughs) like a fool, hoping somehow I might hit the ball out of the air. I missed completely. He caught the pass. I was able to at least knock him over. And that play ended up setting up a touchdown for that team. So then they kicked the ball off to us. We're on offense. We do a couple plays, get nowhere. So we have to punt it away, which means I'm back out on defense again. So this time, lined up against a receiver again. But instead of running uh, a pass play, the opposing team uh, does a run play. And they do a sweep meaning they pitch the ball to the running back, and instead of running up the middle of the field, they run towards the sideline, hoping to get up the sideline to make a big break down the sideline. Now, that means he's coming right at me as I'm set out closer to the sideline guarding a receiver, and what I'm supposed to do in that play is I'm just supposed to contain the running back, meaning my job is to not let him get around me, but to force him back into the middle of the field so that a linebacker coming from the middle of the field can get him. I think to myself, I'm going to make up for my last play, and I'm going to be a hero and get this guy behind the line of scrimmage. So I see him coming. I blow past the receiver, and I'm running up to get him, and he does the exact same thing the receiver does. He fakes like he's going to go inside, and I just lunge for him. He makes his move, and I lunge for him, not realizing it's a fake, And then he goes around me, and I'm like in midair trying to tackle him. And I see him going the other way and breaks the tackle and makes a huge gain. So the game goes. I can't remember if we win or lose. After the game, we're in the locker room, and the coach comes to me, and he says, Hey, listen up. You had a bad game, and that's okay. We're going to put it behind us. Because there are those who play football, and then there are football players And what he's saying to me is he's trying to be encouraging. Like there are just some people who go out there and play football because it's a thing to do. But then there are those who have it deep in their being and they are true football players. And he was trying to encourage me, trying to tell me that you are one of those guys. You are a true football player and we believe in you. Which was greatly encouraging, but I think completely wrong. I think completely wrong. Because by the end of that season, I had lost my starting job to somebody else. They put me on the sideline. Uh, eventually I became a quarterback when I was a senior, started quarterback, and it wasn't because I was that good. It was just that we didn't have anybody who was less worse than I was, and so that's how that came about. And then by the time we got to the end of the year, my senior uh, football banquet, the senior award that I got was the Citizenship Award, which means he's not that good at football, but at least he's a nice guy, right? (laughs) And so this phrase, like, hey, there are those who play football... And then there are football players. The thing that was true of me was like, I was just a guy who played football because I love football. I still do. I watch it all the time. Love football. But you can take that same mindset. You can take that same phrase and you can apply it to lots of different areas 
of life. You can apply it to, to the arts. You could say there are those who like to paint, people who just enjoy painting. It's a fun hobby. But then there are painters. And as you look at their work, you're just blown away at what they can create. You're drawn into the story they're telling just with brush strokes. And it's like, wow, that's amazing. Same can be true of, of music and musicians. There are those who play the cello. There are people who just play the cello. And then there are cellists, people who have mastered the craft. And it's just, ah, oh, when they play, the music comes alive and you're transfixed to another world. You can even say the same thing about people who are small business owners. There, there are those who have a small business in that they have a side hustle, that they run this internet store online. And then there are true small business owners who have a long-standing, successful, sustainable business that provide good services to the world. There are those who try and do these things, but then there are the true ones who have mastered that art and mastered that craft. And that same thing can be said of those who follow Jesus as well. Meaning you can say that there are those who are fascinated with Jesus. There are those who are curious about who he is. Maybe they see him as a unique historical figure. Maybe they're captivated by the stories that he told because there are these ancient stories from 2,000 years ago and we're still telling these stories today. And some of Jesus' stories are known by those who aren't even followers of Christ, but they just know these stories. Or maybe they just think, man, he was such a unique individual who is so grounded in unconditional love and compassion for people. It's just, oh, what an amazing individual. There are those who are fascinated by Jesus, but then there are those who are true followers of Jesus. It's not just that they have this, this fascination with him, but they have this conviction in their bones, deep in their being, that Jesus was the Son of God, that he was the Savior of the world, that he did raise from the dead, and he is in the process of making all things new. So yes, I'm going to dedicate my life to following him. There are those who are fascinated with Jesus, and then there are those who are true followers of Jesus. And the question for us this morning is, which one are you? Have you completely sold out to who he is? Or are you just orbiting around the people who follow him because you're curious, you're fascinated? And then the, the real question is, well, how do you know? How do you know if you're a true follower and a true disciple of Christ? Our passage today starts to ask that question and even gives us some clarity on how we can know what it means to be a true disciple of Jesus. This is how our passage begins. We're in John chapter 8, starting in verse 31, and we read, To the Jews who had believed in him. Now, the majority of chapter 7 and chapter 8 is one scene in John's gospel that lasts one or two, maybe even three days at most, where Jesus is teaching in the temple. He's teaching in the temple courts in Jerusalem, and the reason that he's there is because all of Israel is celebrating the festival of tabernacles. Now, the festival of tabernacles was this annual festival that remembered God redeeming his people from slavery in Egypt, and also celebrated the supernatural provision that God gave his people as they wandered through the desert, making their way to the promised land. So that would mean Jews from all over Israel would come to Jerusalem to celebrate this festival. Lots of activity happening in the city, lots of activity in the temple. And so Jesus takes this opportunity to stand up a couple days in a row and teach in the temple. Now, you might think, well, there's a lot of excitement, a lot of energy, a lot of enthusiasm because of the festival. So maybe that carried over into Jesus' teaching, when in reality, the mood in the temple surrounding Jesus was tense. Meaning there were people there who were wanting and trying to arrest him and to seize him. There were others who were there 
who are plotting and looking for a way to execute him. The mood around Jesus' teaching in the temple was at best tense. And what we read at the end of the last section, if we back up to verse 30, as he's teaching on this given day, it says in verse 30 that even as he spoke, many believed. So even in the midst of the antagonism, even in the midst of the tension, even though it felt like everybody was against him, there were those who were putting their faith in him. And then as we cross into our section today, as we cross into verse 31, what we see is that Jesus is trying to address those people who specifically have put their faith in him. It says, to the Jews who had believed in him, Jesus said. So he's specifically talking to those who have now placed their trust in him. And he says, if you hold to my teaching, you really are my disciples. Then you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. So he's saying, this is what it means to really be my disciple. Now, one of the distinctives of this section as you go from chapter 7 to chapter 8 is there's this, all of this back and forth interaction between Jesus and those who are there listening. Mostly, the interaction comes by way of questions that the crowd are asking Jesus. Because Jesus will say something, causes some sense of confusion, from the crowd. They look for clarity, and they ask Jesus a question, and then he responds. And that cycle happens over and over through chapter 7 in chapter 8. And so Jesus here begins to say a few other things that causes one of those questions, because he says, know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And they answer in verse 33, but well, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be free? Now, this question, as it's presented by John, sounds like a legitimate question, right? They're wrestling through, Jesus says we'll be free, well, we've never been slaves, so how can you say that we will be free? It sounds like a legitimate question, even though it's an inaccurate question. Because when you look back through Israel's history, like they have been slaves of people, right? They're at the the festival of tabernacles, celebrating the redemption of the Israelites from where? Slavery in Egypt. And then eventually they make it to the promised land, and years later, they're hauled off into exile, and they become slaves in Babylon. And then even in this present moment, Rome is occupying Israel. So in some ways, they are under the rule of another country, not full slavery, not full captivity, but yet they're not fully free. And so their question is posed as a legitimate question, but it's also an inaccurate question. But Jesus' response to their question is interesting because his response doesn't fully make sense If who he's responding to are people who have just placed their faith in him. Because he says this in verse 34. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So he's educating them on the effects of sin as it pertains to a relationship with him and membership in the family of God. And then he goes on to say this in verse 37. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. Which seems like a real interesting place for people to be who have just put their faith in him. Why would he say, hey, you're trying to kill me and you have no room for my word in your life when they've just believed in him. It seems to be incongruent with what was said before about, hey, these people are trusting Jesus. Now, that means probably one of two things are happening. Either in this moment, Jesus is trying to address those who have just put their faith in him, but this is a public place, and so there have been lots of different groups of people there, and it could be that another group 
who are unbelieving group is hearing what Jesus is saying, and they're kind of inserting themselves into this conversation that Jesus is having. They're hijacking the conversation and challenging Jesus around these things about freedom. That could be one thing that's happening, or it could be that these people who have believed in Jesus haven't fully believed in Jesus, meaning they're hedging their bets, or their trust in him is conditional, or maybe they're motivated by consumerism, like what can we get from Jesus rather than fully give our lives to Jesus? Because we've seen that before in the Gospel of John. Chapter 6, there are people who are disciples of Jesus. They're pursuing Jesus. They're following Jesus. In chapter 6, he's giving them free meals. He's performing miracles, feeding 5,000 with five loaves of bread and two fish. And they're like, this is amazing. Let's make this guy king. And then when he stops giving them all of these things, they're like, oh. And he starts to say hard things. They're like, oh, I don't know if this is the guy we want to be following. And they bail. Now, John doesn't give us any clarity. Right? He's writing this in kind of an ambiguous way, so we don't have full clarity what's actually going on. But moments like that, for us, when we engage the Scriptures, instead of like trying to work down this rabbit hole to figure out exactly what's going on here, it should cause us to take just a step back and ask the question, okay, but what might God be saying to me in this moment? How might God be encouraging me through this text and I think what we see are there are three things that Jesus says throughout this text that answer the question, what does it mean to be a true disciple? Because that's what he says at the beginning, apparently to those people who believe in him. He says, this is how you will know. This is how you will know that you really are my disciple. And the first thing he highlights is if you hold to my teaching. Verse 31. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Now, this phrase, hold to my teaching, probably makes us think of what he's calling us to is obedience, like doing the thing that he says. He's teaching this, and so he expects us to follow what he's teaching. Now, holding to my teaching isn't less than obedience. Obedience is expected by Jesus, but it's a whole lot more. And the way you see this is that the, the word for hold there is a Greek word that appears other places in John's gospel, and it's the word meno, which means to remain or abide. And you see it surface again specifically in John 15. Because in John 15, it's the well-known passage where Jesus says, I am the vine, and you are the what? Branches, right? So you guys know this. You're good Bible scholars. Love it right? I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, some translations say, if you abide in me, then you will bear fruit. And he actually goes on again in that same passage in John 15 to say, and you will show yourself to be my disciple. So Jesus here is using the same word that he used in John 15. So he's not talking about viewing his word as a checklist, like, oh, I did that. Oh, I followed Jesus' teaching there. Oh, I accomplished that thing. Rather, he's talking about it in terms of a relationship, about what it means to abide, to remain, to be in relationship with him. And one of the ways we do that is through being in his words, being in communication with him through the scriptures. And as you abide in them, as you soak in the scriptures, your life starts to change and there will be a noticeable difference and people will be able to see like, ah, something is happening in your life. Uh, this last week at church here, we had uh, VBS, which was a phenomenal week. Uh, we had the kids in here all week. One of the benefits of going from pews to chairs is that we were able to push all the chairs aside and create this open space for the kids. And they loved having an open space place to, to run and dance. And uh, Nate was dressed up like a crab because it was a beach theme. Uh, we had another individual who's dressed up as a jellyfish leading the kids in song and dance. My daughter was dressed up as a shark. It was an amazing week. Lots of fun. Lots of great things happened. Jackie did a phenomenal job organizing the week. And one of the things 
they did in one of the small groups to teach a lesson was they played with Orbeez. Anybody know what Orbeez are? If you're a parent with young kids, you know what Orbeez are. If your kids are out of the house, you're probably like, I have never heard of this before. So Orbeez sometimes are known as water beads. So if you look at this picture, Orbeez start looking like little beads, tiny little hard plastic beads. And all you do is you drop these beads into water and you let them soak and over time, they become something different. They kind of become like these marbly looking sort of squishy balls. They go from being hard. Oh, see, there they go. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> Don't tell Chris I did that. He's going to be mad at me for getting Orbeez all over the place. But they're like, they're fun and they're squishy and, and they, they bounce, as you can see. They, they bounce. And um, yeah, kid, I mean, kids love playing with them. They're just like, oh. But these while they have the same color as when they started as little plastic beads, while they are uh, round like little plastic beads, they are different in that they've changed because they've been soaking in water and they've absorbed the water into themselves and now have become different. So when Jesus says, hold to my teaching, he's not saying, hey, just go do the things. He's not after rote obedience. He's saying, soak in my word, soak in my presence, abide in relationship with me, receive what I have for you, let it flow from me to you, and you will know that you are my disciple. The world will see that you are my disciple because my word has been hidden away inside you. And so how do you know? One of the marks of a true disciple is that you abide in Jesus' word and that it affects you, and it changes you. The second thing that he highlights here is those who are truly his disciple are, disciples are people who resist the schemes of the evil one. Now, as you move through this passage, the person of Abraham is mentioned significantly, repeatedly. It says in verse 38, I'm telling you what I have seen in the Father's presence, meaning, hey, the Father has sent me. The Father and I are one. I abide in the Father. We have been together. And all I'm telling you, he's saying, is what I have seen and heard from being in my Father's presence. And you are doing what you have heard your Father there, Father do. And so he's making a distinction between his Father and their Father. And again, this causes confusion for the Jews because they respond saying, wait, wait, wait. Abraham is our Father. Now, Abraham was a significant figure in the Old Testament, Old Testament who was called by God to be the first individual in this new family that God was creating. In Genesis 12, God comes to Abraham and he says, I'm creating a whole new group of people, a whole new family, and Abraham, I want you to be the start of it. I'm going to bless you with many descendants. You're going to be the father of many nations. This family is going to come from your line and your lineage. So to identify as a child of Abraham, would be the same to identify as being a member in God's family. But Jesus here is challenging that Abraham truly is their father, which would mean he's challenging their membership in God's family. Because he goes on to say, if you were Abraham's children, then you would do what Abraham did. Which raises the question, well, what did Abraham do. So there's two episodes in the book of Genesis where God calls Abraham. Genesis chapter 12 and Genesis 15. In Genesis 15, God calls Abraham and he says, come out and look up at the sky. It's nighttime. He goes out. He looks up at the sky and he says, see all these stars in the sky. He says, I'm going to make your descendants more numerous than the stars in the sky. And Abraham looks at them all in the black sky, sees all these sparkling stars. And it says that Abraham believed God. Believed God was going to do what he said he was going to do. And it was credited to him as righteousness. The thing that Abraham did was believe. It seems as though these people are believing because it says somebody put their faith in him. But Jesus here again is challenging their belief. Because he says, you're not looking to believe me. He goes on to say, verse 40, As it is, you are looking for a way to kill me. A man who has told you the truth that I have heard from God. 
Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the works of your own father. Again, they're understanding that Jesus is making a distinction between who he says is his father and their father. And they go on to say, well, we are not illegitimate children. The only father we have is God himself. To which Jesus responds with maybe one of the most jaw-dropping statements he makes anywhere in the Gospels. Because they're saying, hey, God is our father. Abraham is our father. We're part of the, the family of God. And Jesus comes back and says, nah, not like you think. Verse 44, you belong to your father, the devil. Straight up saying, you're pure evil. You're disconnected from the Father. You're disconnected from his family. You are evil through and through. And he says, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So Jesus is saying the schemes of the evil one start with deception deceiving people as to what's true in life. And often the thing that accompanies deception when it comes to the schemes of the evil one is temptation. Deception and temptation oftentimes come together. You see this in the garden because he says here that he was a murderer from the beginning, calling back to the beginning. Genesis 1, 2, and 3. God creates this good, beautiful world. He puts Adam and Eve, who he created, into this good world to steward what God has created. And he says, you can eat of any tree in the garden except for one tree, the tree of the knowledge of, the, of good and evil. Eat that and you will die. Well, one day Adam and Eve are hanging out by that tree. And along comes the devil in the form of a serpent. And he says, did God really say, I mean, it's probably not that big a deal, right? It's just one little bite from one piece of fruit, you know, God probably doesn't want you to eat of this tree because he knows that when you do, you will be like him and he wants to be the top dog and not have people compete for his authority. But hey, one little bite could change everything for you. And what happens? This is come to the deception and the temptation. They eat of the tree and the world as we know it is forever changed. Now, here's the thing. The deception that comes with the temptation is that it will bring satisfaction. The, te the, the deception that comes in the temptation, the deception that there's, like, if I do this thing, it will ultimately satisfy me, which never is the case. Uh, when our, our daughters were younger, before we moved here, um, Becky took one of our daughters to uh, on a camping trip with one other friend. It was just her and this one friend and her daughter, Becky and our daughter. So kind of like a mother-daughter camping trip. This would, did one night away, and in that evening they were sitting around the fire. Becky and this friend were talking, and what they did was they brought a little bowl of candy for the girls to share. Now, I don't know if anybody here has kids who make a candy salad. That's becoming like an internet theme that like you just pour all these different types of candy into a bowl. You kind of mix them up. It's usually like gummy, sweet and sour, chewy things and like candy salad. You know, I was like, all right. My kids do it all the time now. So they made basically a candy salad before candy salads were an internet trend. And so Becky is sitting there with this woman and our daughter, um, as she would with this kid, as you would expect, to start eating this candy. Now she looked over at some point and realized that my daughter and this girl had eaten all the candy in this bowl, which maybe isn't that big a deal if it's a small bowl, but it was a good sized bowl and they probably should have portioned it out and left some back at the tent. So she comes home with our daughter the next day and about halfway through the afternoon, our daughter's like, oh, I don't feel so good. My tummy's a little upset. And we think we should probably put her down for a nap. And as we do, everything that was inside of her came out of her. And we knew the thing that made her sick was all the candy she ate the night before. Because what came out of her was pink and smelled a little bit like fruity candy. And just like, oh, she thought that eating all this candy was going to satisfy her. But all it did was make her sick and make her throw it up. Now, you would think maybe she would learn her lesson after that, right? A few months later, we're at a church picnic, and 
as church picnics go, when you're a pastor, a uh, pastor's talking to everybody, my wife's talking to everybody, and there was this dessert table, right? Everybody brings something to pass, everybody brings a dessert. And while we're chatting it up with everybody at the picnic, this one daughter, same daughter, is doing laps around the dessert table, eating everything she can get her hands on. We get home that evening, and again, does the same thing. Everything that's inside her comes out of her, and it doesn't look like pink, but this time it's brown because all she did was eat like chocolate and brownies. And it was like, again, you would think that all of this is going to bring me satisfaction, but all it does is bring shame and accusation. Now, for her, she doesn't like associate it with shame and accusation because she's just like, oh, I just did it again. But as we get older, it's not dessert that tempts us. But it's all sorts of these other things that we think will bring us satisfaction. But all they do is they bring sin. And the language that Jesus is using here is that they enslave us to that sin. And ultimately it brings about death. The deception within the temptation is that it will bring satisfaction when in reality it brings accusation, shame, sin, enslavement to that sin and that shame, and ultimately death. And what Jesus is saying is that when you abide in my teaching, when you remain in me and my teaching, you have the ability to resist temptation when it comes your way. And if you embrace the truth that's in my, tempt- that's in my teaching, what you will find is freedom in life. Because that's where Jesus goes next. All throughout this passage, there's this thread of truth that is woven through it. Like he says about the devil, he is not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. Jesus will go on again in, in verse 44, 45, 46, keep talking about the truth. And it was where he started back in verse 31. Because he said, if you hold to my teaching, you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. But it raises the question, truth about what? Like, is it, is it the truth about who God is? Is it the truth about sin in our life and in our world? Is it the truth about the gospel and what Jesus has done through his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension? His future return? Is it the truth about the validity of the scriptures? And John's not specific here about what exactly the truth is. But I I wonder if what he's trying to get us to see is that it's the truth about ourselves. Because that's what he keeps talking about to these individuals. That if you wrestle with the truth about yourself, you'll be able to see, oh, we're not walking in line with who God created us to be. Because he's talking about their identity, their connections to the family of faith, and ultimately their lack of of self-awareness of the sin and the enslavement to that sin and the death they're experiencing. Because what Jesus is saying is that when you know the truth, when you know the truth about who you are, the result is it will ultimately set you free. I want to invite uh, my friend Andrew to come on up. Um, Andrew has been attending our church for a couple of years. Why don't you just go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, my name is Andrew Murphy. Um, I've been here at Meadowbrook for about a year and a half. Uh, I've got four daughters, two of whom were in the first service and said, don't point at me, so I'm not pointing at them. Uh, Alba and Lumen, who are eight, and then a five-year-old, Havila, and then our two-year-old, Salom. And if your daughter's been in there and she's pulled her hair, I apologize. <laughs> So Andrew helped out with VBS this last week. He was running games. And we were standing in the lobby on Monday and just talking about different things. And you were telling me a little bit about the work you do. So why don't you tell them what it is you do for work? Yeah, so I serve as the executive director for the Wisconsin Inmate Education Association, or WIA, if you want to save 10 minutes of time. And uh, I'm the director of that program. And what we do is we work in Fox Lake Correctional Facility. It's a medium security prison about an hour north of here. And we work with Trinity International University to provide a bachelor's degree in biblical studies to the inmates, as well as a minor in psychology. And the goal of that program is our students are the ones who are there serving life sentences or decades of time. And they're the ones who are the culture shapers in the prison, who are influencing those who are there on shorter sentences. And so our goal is to reach them with the message of Christ, allow them to have this four-year degree, 
And we don't require them to be a Christian to join the program. So you have guys that come in who have no faith. They might be another faith completely. And in the course of that education, there's a transformation that happens in their own life. And then through their time with these other inmates, they're able to then be lights in that dark place. And so what we would say is that the thing that they're studying is the truth, right? They're studying the Bible. They're getting a biblical degree, and they're studying the truth. Now, May and June is graduation season for schools all over the country, and it's no different for you guys. You have a graduation every year, and you were telling me about this graduation that just happened recently for this program, and tell us a little bit about what happened at that, that graduation ceremony. Yeah, so we had a graduation last week, at, and we do the graduation at the prison, and so they get cap and gown, and it's, we were in the gymnasium, and you would think that you were at a high school graduation is kind of how it looks. And so we have all the current students sitting up on the bleachers, and if you were to step outside of that building, you would see the fences and you would know you're in a prison. But apart from that, for just a short period of time, these guys get to just be college students. And so they nominate amongst the class, it was eight guys who graduated, and they nominate one student amongst the ranks to come up and kind of share a message with the rest of the people there. And he goes up and he wanted to, to talk about each student who had graduated and so a little story about each of them. And he goes through and shares about different pieces. But one of the guys he talked about was a guy who has a life sentence. And so there's not a lot of lifers in Wisconsin, and he has a life sentence. And throughout his time in the program, he had been telling everybody, I'm innocent, I'm innocent, I'm innocent. He'd been telling everybody that his entire time he was incarcerated. And through the course of that program, he had applied for the Innocence Project, which is an organization that helps people get representation to get released if they were wrongly convicted. And he got notification that he was accepted, they had taken on his case, and he was going to be starting that process. But over the course of that, this whole truth will set you free, the realization came to him that he needed to be set free. He wanted to be set free, but his freedom wouldn't come from being released. It would come from telling the truth. And so he chose to confess and admit that he had done what he did. And doing that would mean that he would not be released, that his chances of release would not, not be there. And so he chose to be set free while remaining incarcerated rather than get out on a lie and carry that the rest of his life. Which is pretty incredible. I mean, because we would never think that you could actually find freedom behind bars but it's the subversive nature of the gospel, the subversive nature of Christ, is that even when we think we are physically in prison, we can actually be free. free. The freedom that Jesus has for us isn't, hey, I can go do what I want. I can live how I want. It's owning up to who you are, what you've done, trusting that Jesus will make the difference in your life. Can you guys just say thank you to Andrew for coming and telling the story? Thanks, Andrew. He... He would love to talk to you more about the work that he's doing at WIA, and he'll be around after the service if you want to chat with him. But I think that's such a powerful story, because many of us, obviously, we, we are not locked up in prison, but there are many of us here this morning who have created a prison for ourselves. We have created a prison to the sin that we continually give ourselves to, thinking it will bring satisfaction in our life all the while, it's just the scheme of the evil one to say, ah, this will bring you what your heart wants, but it never fully satisfies. And we keep going back to that thing, hoping something will be different. All the while, Jesus is standing right here saying, I'll set you free. Like, I will give you the thing that your heart wants if you will come to me. Now, some of that means we do have to be honest. So embracing the truth at some level means we do have to be honest about who we are, about what we've done. Because sometimes the truth isn't always flattering, and we like to think that we're better off than we are. But Jesus is saying you'll find freedom if you do. And the thing that Jesus, if, if the truth that Jesus is trying to get these folks to see is the truth of themselves, the good news of the gospel is that the way that Jesus sees you isn't wrapped up in your failings, your mistakes, the sin that you've given yourself to. The way Jesus sees you, the truth of you, is that you are loved. I ask my, my kids a series of questions in the morning and in the evening. As we're like on our way to school and at the end of the day, I ask them a series of questions that my hope is that over time it will produce identity in them. And I start both the morning and the evening with the same question. And that question is, what's true about you? Now, their answer to me is not, Dad, I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. 
although maybe that's true at times. They don't answer that way, right? It's, Dad, I'm loved. I'm loved. Regardless of what they did the day before, regardless of the fight they just had with their sister, regardless of the resistance that they give to her, their mom and I. And in the evening, that same question is the first question I start with. What's true about you? And they say, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. They are a precious creature, a precious creation in God's sight. He loves them more than their mother and I ever could. And that's the way that Jesus sees you. When you're able to name, there's a gap in my life. There's a gap in, the, in my life because of the sin that besets me. And we come to Jesus naming that gap. He will say, I can close it for you. When you name that gap, it puts you in a position to receive. Not, you don't have to achieve anything with Jesus. Just receive the love that he has for you. And it will change your life completely. And that's why Jesus says, you will know you're my disciple if you abide in my word. Because that is the continual message of the scriptures. You are loved. You are a good creation. Yes, things have gone sideways. Things are not working out the way that God intended them to, but God has made a plan to restore all things. And if you submit to him, if you open your life to him, if you receive the love he has for you, you will be a part of this new creation project that is taking over the world. And one day you will be able to see like, ah, I am a child of God who has been given everything they need in Jesus, and my life is forever changed. And you will find the freedom your heart longs for. So our invitation to you this morning, if you're in that place where you're feeling stuck, if you're feeling enslaved, if you feel like you keep going to the same thing over and over and over again, the invitation is come to Jesus. Own up to the truth. Believe who you are in Him, and He will set you free. Lord, we thank you so much for what that message means for us. We thank you so much that you are a God who has gone to great lengths to set us free. We ask in this moment that you would give us eyes to see, that we would have the ability to see ourselves as you see us, as people who are in need, but people who are loved, loved beyond measure. And we ask, Lord, that in the process, our lives would change, that we would be different tomorrow than we are today because of the love you have for us. Help us to open our life to you, that we may receive the love and goodness and grace you have for us. Amen.